Hello everyone, um, sorry about the uh, little delay. Um, so my name is uh, Bertrand Dior. I will quickly share my screen. Yeah. So as Brian said, I'm a senior program manager uh, at Microsoft, uh, which means that I suppose I manage programs of sorts and uh, senior armies that I mentioned. And uh, I'm working on the Orchard project, which is a CMS. It's uh, open source. It's under the GSD license. And uh, you can find it at orchardproject.net. This is our uh, main website. And from that, you can find all kinds of stuff, such as download links, uh, some documentation, um, component gallery, and we are going to use that a lot throughout this demo. Um, how you can contribute, and uh, links to discussions uh, which are happening on uh, Codex. <laughs> also on Codex, you can find uh, the latest release. You can find the issue tracker, which is I encourage you to file lots of bugs so that you can make this product better. And you can find the source code. And uh, we are working directly of the Mercurial repository that we have on Codex. So you can see uh, all of our check-ins as they happen. Uh, for example, you can see that Nathan uh, checked in something this morning. All right, so I will uh, switch to my Windows Explorer here. And I will create a new folder. I'm going to call that feedback. And so just to tell you what I'm going to do today, uh, I have no slides. I apologize about that. I'm sure you're already disappointed. I am going to build a website uh, within the time that we have. I'm not exactly sure how far I can go uh, within a hour and a half, but I will try to build something decent and uh, with a few surprises uh, along the way, I hope. Um, not that surprising. Surprises. So let me turn the repository here. So here I'm grabbing the source code from uh, um, Codex. So we let that run. And uh, here it's uh, getting all the change sets, setting up the instance. A uh, quick word about that. Uh, you can get a release, the default release from Codex that has um, the, the, all you need to run the website. Uh, let me show you. When you go to download, this here is the default release. And that's what you need to run our chart. But if you want to do some more serious work, if you want to develop modules, if you want to be able to debug into the source code and stuff like that, I strongly recommend that you get an actual enlistment like I'm doing right here. This, yeah, this will enable you to have a lot more control and, uh, you will avoid a few uh, problems related to uh, uh, just having the website. And most of all, um, yeah, you have the full source code and uh, you'll be able to work efficiently in Visual Studio with the full solution with all the projects. And that is a big change. So this is being a little slow. Um, I'll, let him, I'll let him run in the background and I guess I'll just uh, continue to uh, show you the website uh, while that happens. Uh, on the home page here, um, you can see that we have some uh, featured articles and that's also very important. Those articles are from you. Um, we, I, I just aggregate uh, what people post about uh, our child. So if you, have, if, you, if you have written an interesting article, send me an email. By the way, my email is this. Send me an email and uh, I will feature your blog post on the home page of the project. Um, we also have in the documentation, we have a, an interesting document that you might want to, to look at regularly if you want to know what's happening currently 
And these are our current priorities. This is what we are working on right now. Today, I'm going to work on the latest um, uh, integration branch. That means this is the latest table branch. But it's a little more advanced than what you would uh, download from Codeplex directly. Uh, so it has more changes than and if you've used Orchard, you see some changes. Uh, so currently, we're we're working on uh, some practices. We're working on uh, improving the user experience, the admin UI, particular the widget management and the list management. Um, we are working on making the uh, positive experience better. We have a new feature for importing and exporting. Um, and we are, we, are we are improving the uh, scenarios. So I can see that we're almost done here. And now it's printing the actual files. Okay, so once this is done, now I can open this directory and I have my full solution here. Um, before I open the solution, I will open the Mercurial Workbench and I will filter that list of, uh, of check ins on the integration branch, which is what I what I want today. I want something stable enough to do a compelling demo, uh, but something that is a little, a little more advanced than uh, what you can download from the text right now. So actually, the, the whole demo that I'm going to do today, you can reproduce exactly. There is nothing, we do everything publicly. It's, uh, it's open source. All right, so now I am synchronized on the integration branch. So what I have here is uh, what was there on that, on that branch. So if I open the source directory inside of, uh, of my uh, enlistments, I can find the Orchard solution, and I can open that. So I give you a quick tour of the organization of the solution. Uh, it may be a little intimidating at first because there are a lot of projects in there, and that's part of the game. We are uh, building a very, very modular CMS, and uh, we are taking it as hard to uh, only include in the core what needs to be in the core, and even what we build is done as modules as, as much as possible. So the first directory that you'll find in the solution is the modules directory. And as you can see, all those are modules that we have built. And nothing that we are doing here uh, is relying on any like, secret APIs or anything like that. You can do everything we are doing, which also means that you can replace any of those. In principle. Uh, you can see, for example, that even uh, the module management is a module. So this is, this is going pretty far. Um, after the modules, we have uh, the specs directory. So this is, uh, these are um, uh, the spec flow uh, tests. So many integration tests. We have the test directory with some unit tests and uh, that sort of thing. We have a themes directory. So themes are a way to uh, completely change the look and feel of your website. Uh, we have tools that pass on that, and then you have core and framework, and web. So framework is really the, the lowest layer of the system, uh, where we have stuff that couldn't possibly be in a module. Core contains the modules that, uh, those are really modules, but there are modules that you will never, ever want to remove from the system. So we group them under a single or charge core uh, banner. Uh, and then you have the website, and this is what you will actually run. And uh, when you get the default release from Podplex, this is what you get. You get what's inside of this directory. So it, it, it's less intimidating because you have only one uh, project. But if you show everything in there, you can see that actually modules are really under there. So in terms of file organization, modules are here. Uh, in the solution, you, you can find it here. And themes are also here, etc. Um, so let's run this. Okay. 
Well, this is Julian. He take a little time in the first. Um, I can probably tell you a little more about uh, the organization of the, of the uh, modules here. We are going to add more modules each year. We are going to build one here. And we are also going to build a scheme in a moment. So when I launch this, um, I will get the setup screen for the application, which will ask us for a few um, bits of information. Okay, type that. It will be a lot faster next time. All right. Okay. So here is our site. Uh, so I will uh, call this video because I'm going to build uh, a website for myself. I need to choose a username here for the, the administrator of the site, the site owner. Uh, I, I just see that name. Then we need to choose a password, confirm it, and we need to choose uh, the database storage. So you can use uh, a SQL server, a full SQL server, or a SQL Express database if you want to. Then we just give it the connection string. You can give it a database table prefix, so that enables you to put uh, your data in an existing database without conflicting with other stuff. Uh, and it's also useful when you're doing that type of We just use the built in uh, SQL server compact storage. And here, this is a new feature from uh, the next, uh, for the next release of the Orchard, the Orchard 1.3, where you can choose what kind of site you want to uh, build. And this is basically enab enabling some specific modules uh, for you and, and creating a configuration uh, that, uh, that suits your needs. And the great thing about that is that those recipes, we call them recipes, uh, are specified by an XML format, and you can build your own. So if you build, let's say, an e-commerce module, and you want to build a version of Orchard that does e-commerce out of the box, you would actually create a recipe like that, package this into the, your, your uh, installation package, remove the other ones, and uh, uh, people would, would just uh, run setup and get uh, the application configured as you intended which is quite, quite nice. So I will start with a blog. Uh, um, knowing that nothing is irreversible here, uh, no matter what recipe I choose, I will always be able later to enable other modules or disable stuff that, that this recipe enables. So let's click finish here. Oh. Not good. Here it stops. So of course this has to happen. I mean, uh, it never happens, so it has to happen during the demo.
Not enough sure weight, that's what happens when you. And actually, we will see a couple of bugs uh, as we do the demo that I will fix uh, as we go. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so here's my site. So this is what I get uh, right after setup. So it already has a blog uh, pre configured where I could add some posts. Um, I'm not going to do that right now. Instead, I will. Click on the edit button of this widget here. So, oh yeah, let, let me just uh, show you around real quick what this home page is. Uh, so we have the home page here. We have a, a zone here that has the contents of the page. And in this case, it's uh, configured to show uh, the blog that was created during setup. And we have three widgets here. And widgets are readable pieces of UI that you can position on the page. And we'll manipulate that a lot. So let's edit this one. And this will give you a first glimpse at the admin panel. So as if you have used uh, our chart before, uh, you can probably uh, see that there has been changes. Let me just do something real quick here. And that's a little trick when you're working with Cassini, um, which is that the local host uh, binding uh, does not fit well with um, IPv6, yeah, yeah, and you, you may have noticed that the admin UI wasn't displaying very fast, in particular the, the icon square on very fast, and that was because only one request was going through at any given time. So just using 127001 makes things go faster, and uh, if you use IIS, you don't have that sort of problem. It's just this case. Uh, okay, where was I? Okay, widgets. So I wanted to uh, manage uh, that uh, widget that I have on the home page. So I will, I will explain how that uh, uh, UI works a little better later. Uh, so this is the widget that I, that I had and that I wanted to edit. So first, I will, we will move it uh, uh, in a different zone. Um, eh, before I do that, actually, yeah. Uh, I, I will want to change themes later, so I might as well do it now so that I have the right zones here. Um, yeah, the, the zones here, which are the places where you can put widgets, are defined by the theme. And uh, if I change the theme, I will have a different set of zones, so I might uh, want to do that before. So let me do that. So here I just click on the themes um, uh, menu, and I'm just going to go online to the online gallery, and this is actually querying um, the gallery that you can find uh, here. Uh, it's just showing the same data that you can find here. Okay, so I can choose this theme here, Pontoso, which is pretty nice, and I can click install, and that will download uh, that theme to my uh, local installation of Orchard, and uh, 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 make it part of the Available themes. All right. So I can go to install now. And there it is. So I can set it as the current theme. And so the default theme I don't want anymore. So I will disable it. I could actually completely uninstall it, but I would just disable it. All right, so now when I go back to my uh, front end, I should see the new routine here. There it is. The content is the same, only the looks of it change. So I'll edit that uh, widget again. And here you can see that the list of zones is a lot, a lot shor shorter, which is uh, so that all thing, the default thing, is very, very flexible. You have lots of zones. And those zones are collapsible, which means that uh, when there is nothing in, in there, they just don't show at all. Uh, but it can be a little intimidating because you have a lot of zones. Um, 
So here, I'm just going to choose the content aside, which is another way uh, of seeing sidebar. We might as well open the sidebar, actually. Um, now I have the concept of layers. Uh, layers are an important concept, um, and that enables you to have a lot of flexibility in the way you set up widgets on your site. Layers are specifying under what condition the widgets that it contains are going to appear. And Orchard ships out of the box with five predefined uh, layers, and you can add your own. And you can even add, program your own uh, rules uh, to determine the, the, the displaying of widgets. Um, the default rule is going to apply to all pages. So if I put a widget in the default layer, it will appear everywhere. Uh, then you have authenticated and anonymous layers, and the widgets in those will only appear if the user is authenticated or if the user is anonymous. Uh, disabled is used, you know, as a parking space uh, if you want to uh, put a widget out of the way without losing it. And the home page, as the name uh, implies, is only applying to the home page. And I will show in a minute how this is defined. So here I will choose default because I want it everywhere. I put it in position one. I will call it about me. And I will change the contents into this. Hi, I'm Bertrand, and this is my personal website. So let's save that. Go back to the site, and here you can see it. Uh, I don't want those two widgets here, so I will go back to my dashboard, uh, widgets, and those guys are on the home page. They are here, so I will just delete them. We are redoing that whole UI uh, in one moment. Uh, it's fairly horrible. But uh, it's going to be the way. Uh, so, what I said earlier about rules, let's look at the rules for those guys. So, here you can see that this rule, the home page, only applies if the URL is slash. And if we look at the default layer, it's always applied. So, here, what's interesting is that the syntax here is, uh, uh, it's a subset of the Ruby syntax, so you could you do this, well, actually, I'm sorry if I forget it, like that. And uh, just a little bit of If I had an about me page, for example, oops, I could do that. And uh, that layer would then apply to both of those pages. Um, so, lots of flexibility in there. And uh, those keywords here, they are not really keywords, they are just method calls and uh, into, uh, rules, and you can define your, your own rules. And uh, actually, if you go uh, to the gallery, you can, you can find that people have written uh, new rules uh, to uh, show or hide uh, widgets depending on various conditions. So this one is only going to display your widgets if you have a certain content type in display. Uh, this one is going to filter on roles, uh, etc., etc. And you can, you, yeah, you can, you can write pretty much anything you want. All right. So now I've removed everything that was specific to the home page. I have nothing here in the zones, but I have one widget. Uh, in the content side, uh, in the default layer, which is this. All right, so let's put some contents uh, in that site. And to put that content, I'm going to recycle some content from my uh, technical blog. Um, and the way I'm going to do that is by opening a command line and running an import command. So here, I'm in Windows Explorer, I hit Shift on the keyboard, which you cannot see, and then, then I right click. And this is a useful trick that gives you this additional uh, menu entry here in Windows Explorer that enables me to open a, a, a command window on that directory. Um, 
So now I can type in R chart, and this is going to run the R chart command. And this is extremely useful and extensible. So here it's initializing, and this is actually running uh, the, the site in a command line environment. And it's asking for all the modules that are installed if they have commands. That means that um, you can create your own commands uh, to, uh, to extend that, that set of uh, commands that come with the modules that we should. And here, the one that I will be interested in is this one, the login part. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this is not a very, very good uh, way to import. Uh, it will do for the demo, but if you want to uh, seriously import content, uh, first there is a blog and air module that is available on the gallery, and that is going to import your contents, your tags, and everything, which this is not doing. Uh, and we are also shipping an import-export feature in our chart All right, so this imported some uh, uh, contents into my blog, so I can refresh here. And the contents is here, so I can go to one of those posts here and read something interesting about our chart. Okay, so that's nice, but what I don't like here is that the summary is not the way I want it. Uh, so as you can see, it's just cutting off the text. Sorry, uh, sorry about that noise. So it's cutting off the text of the, uh, some page that is kind of random. It's not exactly random, of course. It's just cutting it uh, uh, across a world boundary uh, after a certain number of characters. But this is not what I want. I want the first paragraph, or I want to go to the special marker that I have that, that uh, specifies the project. Um, so, well, let's look at how we can do that. Okay, yeah. so let's go into the themes directory. In the themes directory, I will first show all the files so that we can see control so in here, which is the theme that I installed. And we have a number of things in there. Uh, we have some images in the content directory. We have some scripts, and some styles, and we have some views. And for the moment, we are going to uh, focus on the views here. And um, <clears throat> the one that I'm interested about to begin is layout. So let me show you what's in layout. Layout is a very important file. Uh, it is what will render basically everything between uh, body and slash body. So it's doing a number of interesting things here. It's including uh, star sheets. So this one is, uh, for example, is including the crazy fonts that uh, we use in the title here. Okay. Um, and it's also including uh, JPEG. And the reason why you need a registration or an inclusion API instead of just uh, uh, including the tags is that styles and scripts are shared resources. So you want to be sure that uh, you manage collisions and, uh, uh, and so on. As don't forget, we are in a modular environment, so you can add modules that are going to do all kinds of crazy things that, that you don't know in advance. So you need to be a good citizen and you need to share uh, resources. And the list of scripts that you include is a shared resource, so you need to go through a specific API to do that. So that two modules that require object learning are just going to include this one, for example. Um, so there is some uh, 
some coding here that I'm not going to go into too much details. An interesting thing here is this. Okay, so the work context is basically your org chart context within that view, within that context. And it has access to the layout. And actually the layout is this here. Um, and after the layout, you can see that it's accessing header and footer here. And those are zones. So I briefly talked about zones before, that's where the widgets go. Um, but actually, widgets are not the only things that can go into those zones. And this is where I need to start talking to you about shapes. Shapes are dynamic objects. Dynamic in the, uh, in the sense that uh, they are uh, they implement the dynamic uh, interfaces from uh, .NET 4.0, which make them very, very, very flexible. And we use them as, let's, let's say, a view model of source. You can see shapes as dumb, dumb uh, data bags um, that are then going to be rendered by templates. So there is a mapping between the shape name and the template name. And the template is just going to uh, dig into that uh, data bag and uh, render things. For example, <coughs> Here, we are creating a new shape that is called branding. And we are adding it to header, which is a zone, but the zone is a shape. So we are creating a new shape, adding it to a zone. And this is the position where we want it to, to appear, but that's not what's important here. What's important here is that we have a new shape that we are creating on the pattern, and we see other examples of shape creation. Uh, but it, it's being created on the file, and it's going to be added to that zone, and it's going to be rendered by the template that's called branding.cshtml. So this looks a little bit like a user control, in a way. Um, a little bit like a, well, yeah, but except that it doesn't have all the crazy life cycle that the control would have. Uh, it's a lot more lightweight. So if we open branding, for example, this is uh, displaying the, uh, the the side name. So this is this this shape here. Um, the other shape that we have here is Badger Funnel, and we can also open that. And as you can see, it's rendering. Uh, it's also in here, and uh, if we look at the front end, this is this part here. So if you want to do uh, copyright, uh, if you want to do this, then I refresh, and uh, that is. So this is really what's going on. Uh, when we are rendering an Orchard page, we are really rendering a tree of shapes. And each of those shapes are, are going to be uh, mapped to uh, a specific template. Now, when the system is looking for a template, it will first look at the current theme, and then if it doesn't find it, it will revert to uh, modules uh, that also have use holders. For example, here, I have a user shape, but here I don't have, oops, I don't have a user template. And that's because that template is actually someplace else. So if I look for it, it apparently is in uh, Orchard Core. And here it is. And so it's displaying uh, the sign-in uh, the, the sign link if you're not authenticated. That's this part here, or it's, it's displaying welcome, wherever you are, etc. So you can see it here. So let's do something uh, interesting here. Let's copy that. I, I told you that if you have one in your theme, it will take precedence. So let's do just that. And copy that here. I want to leave in this object. Okay, so this is a copy that I, that I put inside of my theme. 
So if I want to add some uh, hello world text in here, so here I haven't modified my module or my core uh, optional application, but I was able to override the rendering of something that was defined in the core in the core module. There I go. Hello world. Okay, I'm going to quickly delete that file. Um, usually we try to not, um, if we can avoid it, we try to not modify stuff that uh, that we didn't write. Um, so actually to create my own uh, modifications to that theme, I will create my own theme. And the way I'm going to do that, is that from my command line, I'm going to create a, a, a new theme. To create a new theme, so I'm, I'm going to use the command line, I'm going to use scaffolding from the command line, and to use scaffolding, I need to uh, label the feature. And on this command line, what you can see is that the important part here is that we are basing that theme on Contoso. And that adds another layer of uh, uh, indirection, or well, not indirection, but another layer of another place where uh, the theme engine is going to be able to uh, look for your views. Um, so what will happen now if I activate that uh, theme is that uh, it will first look into my theme, and if it doesn't find it, it will find it will look into Compose. So and if it doesn't find it, it will look into Modules. So now I have a new theme. Um, uh, okay. Um, so there is a bug. Been there for a while. As you can see, my new theme went into modules. This is not right. It needs to go into themes. So I uh, will just cut it from here and paste it here. Um, oh, and my uh, my web server stopped when I uh, loaded the solution. Should have. We are also working on start of time right now. Okay, let's go to the themes. Yes, so I have my new theme here. Oh, the picture here is not accurate. All I need to do to fix that is to, uh, I will base my, uh, my theme is based on control source, so I will just Steal that image. That that preview image that you saw. That's the theme that PNG. That's at the root of your theme. Uh, so I can just copy that one over here. Place. Fresh this. Okay, there it is. I can set it as the current theme. 
Okay. And when I go back to the front end, nothing seems to have changed because my theme was based on composable. Despite the fact that it's virtually empty, it doesn't have any issues, it doesn't have anything right now. But uh, what's important here is that I will be able to make modifications to that theme without affecting uh, Contoso. So that means that if I get an update to Contoso, I will be able to download and install that, and the modification that I made to my site uh, uh, will not be overwritten by that because I put them in a different place. So let's start making making some uh, uh, changes. So I copy the layout into my own team. The project. Okay, so this is my uh, my new layout. Uh, we can see that it's working by doing some. Uh, Text in here, refreshing. Uh, and then that is okay, so we, we are affecting uh, the site doing this. Um, going back on shapes, I, uh, I'd like to show you a few uh, interesting things of the shapes. Um, the shapes are dynamic and they can also have some uh, dynamic properties. So if I do this, um, this yeah. for example, this means that not only am I creating a new branching shape, I'm also setting the full property uh, with the value uh, 42. And then the bar property is class. And now, if I also copy the branding from Control Store over to my team, I can, next to the site name, I can add model that true and model the bar. So the uh, model here represents the shape being currently rendered. So here I should get 42 and that. Let's see. And that is. Um, <clears throat> so I could also do something like that. Uh, um, instead of setting the properties in there, I could do and get the exact same for dynamic projects very very flexible very very um <coughs> <clears throat> so this uh, is all uh, side path into shapes. Uh, we help us understand better what happens later. Uh, so let's get back to what I wanted to saw, which was to have a better summary. Uh, so first, if we want to modify how that summary render, we need to find where the template is. Uh, that 
used to be something fairly complex. It was, you just had to do some guesswork, dig into the, the modules, um, see what's implicated by the, the system, um, basically do some labor project. That wasn't very useful. And you only see a very early version of them, getting a lot, a lot better uh, and that's all pressing the critical uh, designer tools uh, and <clears throat> And what this is doing is that it's setting a little thing here that enables you to highlight the zones and shapes that are on the page. Use the So let's try with zones first. So when I click the, the zones, I can see actually what the zones are available. So here I see the header zone, the navigation zone, uh, the content zone. The content of the size of the program is and so so that's all I for the shape and that's what we need. Right now, so this is a little intrusive in the rendering. We, we are also working on that, and it will be completely not intrusive in the final version. But I can click on anything in the screen and find out what shape is responsible for that. So here, you can see that the shape is pass command body summary. That kind of makes sense, um, and it has a display type, which is uh, a way to specify different ways of rendering the same shape, variations of the same shape. Uh, it's in position 5, and uh, it's nice, but okay. Uh, what's important is that the template here, mm. yeah. uh, the templates that are able to override this are those. So for example, if I just want to override that template for blog post, I can create a template with that name and work there. I can also see, that's a weird bug, uh, the, the source code for that template, I should be able to see that, yeah. that is a very, very early version. So what I will do is that I will actually create a, a file of that name um, in my uh, theme. So let's go back to the dashboard and disable that feature because it's affecting the site a little too much. But now we know what to do. Okay, so I'm going to start from the existing template, which I, I now know is Core, command, fuse, this one, pass command, body scenario. So let's copy that into my theme and so I, I'm going to affect all the, the, the summaries. I, as, you, as you've seen, I could only affect uh, blog posts if I wanted to. But I just have to And here I have some more sophisticated logic. So this part of the code here is looking for the first paragraph. And this part of the code is looking for a standard um, uh, delimiter that's in a comment that you can put. This is the same convention that WordPress is using, for example. And if I include that, I'm, I'm specifying explicitly where I want the break to happen in my blog post. And then I'm just displaying that, uh, that, uh, that text that I so yeah, so I'm getting the content item, uh, getting its HTML, and slicing it the way I want, and displaying that as the summary. So if I save that, refresh, oops, let's refresh that, put my content from end. And the summary is more, it's closer to what I wanted, but there are lots of issues here. 
uh, because I included the, the HTML for the first paragraph of my post, I'm also including the images that I have in the post, and this is messing up my, um, my layout. So here I need to do some uh, CSS, adjust CSS adjustments. So, um, I will spare you the detective work needed to figure out what uh, uh, what classes I need to change in my uh, CSS. But you know, suffice it to say that the uh, um, the Firebird-like tools that you find in all browsers today help you immensely figuring that out. And I highly recommend that you do you, your work from that. So I will take a shortcut here, and I will just tweak the CSS directly. The way I tweak the CSS is starting from Composo, copy it into my own team, and here I happen to know, oops, I happen to know where to look. Which is content items, content item. Yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. And the class here kind of makes sense. I, I mean, we are in the list of content items, and we are tweaking a content item. So here, what I want to add is a minimum height, and I will set that to suitable and twenty So. Um, the layout of my summary is now is a lot better with that change. But if you looked carefully, you might have noticed that we have some images here that just went away. So why would that be? Well, in that starship here, we have some references to background images, which are specified using yeah, URL. And you know, pointing to images with a relative path from the starship. And now that we copied the starship from Pontoso, we, we didn't copy the images with it. So we could do two things. We could copy the images from Pontoso, or we could change the path here. So I don't want to copy stuff that I already have, so I will just change the, oops, the path here. And I will just look for URL of, yeah, and find all of those and fix them. There aren't that many. First, some new comments. Okay, I think we're done here. Save that. And our images should be back now. There you go. All right. Um, there are still some things that I don't like in there. Um, <clears throat> for example, let me sign out real fast so that I get rid of the edit boxes. Uh, I don't like that this line here is on top of my uh, post, so in the same uh, content uh, oops, items. Okay, so in this one, yeah, I want that to be on the bottom here. So border content. Say fresh. There we go. And I don't like that stuff here. I, I don't want it there. Um, so I could bring the, the shape tracing back and figure out what shapes are responsible for that. Uh, uh, just uh, to save time, I will just tell you what they are. Um, and they are the routable title here. So that's the title of my blog that is getting kind of 
no, this, this one. This is our fourth item. And this is the description. So both come from uh, the blog, and they are being rendered by shapes that I can find in the module. So for example, if I go to blogs, views, um, uh, blog, blog description. Yeah, this is one. This is one of the shapes that is responsible for displaying that stuff. So I could override that template and put nothing in its place. That would absolutely work. Instead, I'm going to do uh, something different that is also quite powerful and interesting, which is to use placements. And let me copy an existing placement info. You can have placement info files in any module or any team. And what placement is doing is that it's specifying where shapes go. We've seen that templates enable you to specify how shapes render, and placement is specifying where they go, where they render. Oh, are we have one? Yeah, we have one. Okay, so this one is empty. Uh, I'm going to fill it with this. So here is what this is doing. It's saying, okay, well, when the content type is blog, so when you are rendering the blog content item, I want this part here, the blog description, and this part here, the workable title, to go into limbo. Uh, dash here is a special zone that we understand as, well, okay, don't render this. Instead, I could do something like that. I could specify a zone name, um, and uh, send it after, before, or at a, specify, at a specific position, or at a complex specific position. So this is fairly rich. So let's test by this, for example, and see what happens. So the uh, title, multiple title is gone, and this guy is here. Well, let's, let's do, uh, yeah, after. And that should put it on the bottom of the page. Okay. Let's just remove it. Nice guy. And our blog is starting to look the way I want it to. <clears throat> All right. So. Let's uh, add a few things on this sidebar because this is, uh, we, we want, for example, to have uh, the recent blog posts. Let's put widgets and uh, recent blog posts is actually something that comes with the blog um, uh, module. So let's add this. And we'll add it to content side. Give it title. For this blog, yes, uh, and we want five items here. Okay, let's look at that. Oh no, this is using the same summary template as we have been using here, so that won't do here. Uh, what we need here is to render just the title with a link, and that's it. So, how are we going to do that? Well, I could bring out shape tracing again and figure out that this widget here is being rendered by, um, uh, by the widget, and the widget itself is a content item that is creating shapes that are getting rendered. So, all I need to do is find the right shape, and the right shape here that I will discover in the shape tracing is parts, blogs, recent blog posts. It's actually uh, this one. So I will just copy that guy into my team. Uh, for the moment, it's doing nothing to uh, smart. It's just um, using the default rendering of the list instead. I want to do that. So here what I'm doing is 
getting the list of blog posts from the model. So here I something a little weird. Uh, the model here is the uh, widget has a shape that is called content item that is the list. And that list has a property that's called content item. So here that's not too elegant, but uh, uh, it took me uh, a couple of minutes to find out what was going on here. And again, I debugged into the shapes and uh, saw what was happening there, and I, I found that I could get to the items this way. If I don't have any posts, I, I display no posts. And if I do have posts, I display uh, a URL with then I look over the blog post, get the title, the content item, and just display an AI with uh, an item display, which is uh, uh, an extension method that Orchard is uh, giving you that will create a link for that content item with that title and linking to that item. Okay, so let's try this. Refresh. And there I go. We have our recent post here. <coughs> um, well, the style is not too pretty, so I will, I will modify that style a bit by adding a specific style. Okay. So as you've seen in my template, I have a different um, class here. That I'm finding here. Um, yeah, I'm adding a border, I'm adding some padding. This should be a little bit better. There you go. That looks nice. And now I can click on those and get to those content items. Alright, so uh, another thing that I'd like to have on my blog is the tag cloud. And tag cloud, unfortunately, doesn't come in your team. So what's really nice and what's getting nicer and nicer is that um, this is really a community project. And uh, less than three months after we launched, we already have 110 modules in the gallery. And thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who submitted modules. And, uh, don't hesitate to submit more. It's just fantastic how you can just find lots of useful stuff in there and many more things to come. So here I want to find the tag cloud. Um, someone made a tag cloud. Who? Who's this guy? Um, so I just add that. Modules. And again, the module gallery is included in the dashboard. So you can go there and uh, let's find cloud. There it is. Install. Uh, that's a bug that's been fixed. So now it's downloading from the gallery, copying it into my uh, website and uh, activating the feature. Okay, it's, been, uh, it's been installed. That it needs to be upgraded is a bug that we have already corrected. Now I can go to the widgets. Uh, my text file is here. I can add it. To content the side, and uh, I will put it to tags. Um, here I should enter the slug of the blog that uh, I want the uh, uh, <coughs> cloud for. And, uh, I want five buckets. Okay. That's, uh, I, 
that's the number of different sizes you have in the stack child. Uh, say, And for the moment, it's empty because I don't have any tags on those guys. So let's, let's tag a few things very fast. Oh, that's probably the problem. Because my blog is promoted to the home page. And um, here it's expected the files to the blog. Yeah, that's expected. Yeah, that's expected. Um, so now it's, uh, it's not style. Um, all I have to do is to add some CSS that will specify the different sizes for the different uh, uh, frequencies of tags. And there it is. Um, <clears throat> so I could add a few more uh, widgets, and I invite you to just uh, browse through the, uh, the gallery to find some, uh, some interesting ones. Uh, I had some, uh, I, I added some Twitter modules, some uh, Xbox uh, uh, gamer card modules, and uh, Zoom module, all sorts of interesting things. But just to save a little time, uh, I'll leave that as an exercise to uh, the viewer here. Uh, I will buy, build my own uh, modules, module instead. All right, so. What I'd like to do here is to uh, create a new section on my site where I can write product reviews. So the first thing I do here is to go into my features and enable a feature that's called content types and that enables me to create new content types. So I'm going to create a new content type. So create new type. I'm going to call this review. Review. Great. And I'm going to add parts. So here I need to explain how content types are built. In Upshot, contents are composed from parts and fields. So it really is a composition model. Uh, it's not an inheritance model or anything like that. It's a strong composition composition model. And we are building a type system, a real runtime type system um, that is built on aggregation composition rather than inheritance or that sort of thing. And here we are going to compose existing parts uh, to build our review. So our review will have the body it will have the common part, which is the people. It will be containable, and this will be popular later. Um, well, we will be able to input it, it, uh, that into a list. Um, it will be routable, which means that it will have a nice URL. Uh, we want uh, tags. And I will also add some, I, I will add some more later, but I, need to, I will need to install them first. So that we do for now. I can save this. And you may have noticed already that I have a, a new review menu entry that appears here. If I click on that, I can create a new review. So for the moment, it's very much like a blog post because we haven't done anything uh, specific to it. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I want in a review is some star uh, 
ratings. So I would add that. Uh, we'll download a voting module. All that. And I will install uh, star rating. So this is downloading, installing locally. Okay. The double module that I want is star, which is relying on the voting API that I just installed. Okay, it should be done in a few seconds. Okay, and I need to upgrade. Oh. All right. Um, so now I should be able to actually put my existing content types. And, and add that part. And so I can add it to review by editing the, the content type and adding stars. But I can also go to existing types such as blog posts and add it there as well. So now when I go to my site, I now have star rating. Um, so there are is a little bug here. Oh, <laughs> there was a little bug here yesterday, but Nathan, who wrote the stars, star rating module, fixed it uh, this morning, apparently, because I don't have to fix it. Fantastic. Thanks, Nathan. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, let's save me a little time. Um, yeah, so I want to go back to my reviews here. And I can start actually creating uh, reviews. So let's say, for example, that I want to review that book here, which is a fantastic book, by the way. Okay, and I will just steal a review from someone. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Steal that. And I put some tags, so I'll put my book and publish this. <coughs> and so if I go to that page now, here is my review. So that's nice. I created a new type, started filling it up. But um, one thing that I'd like to add here, and I have about 10 minutes to do so, um, <coughs> is to add a way to buy this book. So I will create my module for that. For that. 
Uh, and to do that, I will generate code. Uh, so here I'm creating a new module called Buy from Amazon. So I, I might go over time a bit. I hope that's all right. Um, okay, so the, my module was created. Uh, Visual Studio is prompting me uh, to reload the solution. Maybe I should have saved the solution before I created the Well, let's see. Uh, okay, so here is my new module. I see this T here, so we should be fine. So this is my new, my new module. It has a manifest, which is where I specify what it, uh, what it is, what it does. So uh, we are. And so what I want, let me explain what I want. What I want is something that enables me to I want one of those badges here on the side of my site that will enable people to uh, buy the book from Amazon from my page. Um, this batch here has a, a few settings, such as the colors of the text, of the links, uh, the, the size, the border, uh, and a few other options. Those options I don't want to repeat on each and every one of my uh, reviews, so instead I will build some global settings for it. So I will go to uh, here, I will create a new class here that I would call associate account settings part of all. What it does, it has some default values, but it's basically specifying all the uh, characteristics of our badge that we want to, uh, con to conserve across uh, instances of uh, regions. Um, in order to actually, oops, what's that? Ooh, I have some cursor issues. Um, in order to uh, 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 add that to the database, to match, match that to the database, I will create a migration. So migrations are descriptions of the evolution of your uh, uh, of your module, and um, they are how you describe how you operate from one uh, version of your module to another, and this is typically where you modify the database to follow those changes. And the first one, uh, the first one that you want to do is going to create the table for our settings report. So here it's creating a table that's called associate account settings part record and the system will know how to match that with the appropriate record class by name and it has all the columns that I just specified. And the mapping will be done automatically from. Now I need the part which is going to use the record that we just created. And the path is what we are actually going to add to content types. So let's just do the count CDs. Um, settings part. And this one is just going to surface the properties from the report. We could do without it in principle, but it's just 
the nice of the use this way. Um, and then I'm going to need a handler. And what the handler is doing is that it's a, a handler is a little like a filter in uh, MPC. And it's going to handle a number of events and uh, do some uh, wiring of, uh, of our part. So, and settings and where did I put it? Yeah, that's right. Actually, yeah, I will be on the handlers folder that we need to see. Okay, so what this handler is doing is that um, it's specifying that the storage should be done in a should be done by a repository of account settings cart records. And it's also saying an interesting thing, which is that whenever a site type is getting activated, you should add this part. So we could specify that in metadata, but this is another, another way of doing it. <clears throat> so this is a little plumbing. Yeah. There won't be that much of it, but unfortunately for the moment it's necessary. Then we are going to specify the driver for that, and the driver is like a controller in MVC except that it acts at the path level instead of acting at the whole request level. So it's fine and brain controller. But it's essentially performing the same uh, function. Okay, so what this is doing, first it's injecting a dependency. And that, you will see that everywhere in our chart, we're using Autofact for dependency injection. And whenever you need something from a service or whenever you need to include dependency in one of your classes, uh, this is how you do it. You just uh, specify your private property, you inject it through constructor. And uh, the system will take care of injecting an instance of that interface here uh, when instantiated this. So we can just count on this dependency uh, to come from the environment. It has three interesting, well, this one has only two interesting data. You, You'll see another driver later that has a third one, but this one is just going to take care of the uh, addition of the part. And what it's doing is that when this part is being edited uh, from the admin UI, uh, we are going to create a content shape for that. And on that uh, content shape, well, we set the template type, we set the model to be the part. Uh, yep. Yeah as we got it from the site settings. And we're setting a prefix, which is a way to manage collisions on the template. The other editor method is the same, except that it's getting an updater in addition. And this one is, is going to be used uh, to handle the, uh, uh, the postbacks. Uh, so the only thing it's doing is trying to update the model. So to persist actually what we changed and uh, then go back to this version that is going to re-display the same thing. So we're creating a shape. That shape is going to be rendered by a template, and that template is what I'm going to create in a second. Uh, I'm going to create that in views. Uh, I need to add editor template. And uh, then we the class A class. Uh, 
so uh, our page is top settings account settings top and space which you know. And for sure it is going to be pretty boring, it's just a bunch of uh, fields, of editor fields for the different members that I have on my settings. Uh, and then I would need to specify the placement uh, for this. So, because I have so little time left, I'm going to... Uh, I lost my cursor again. I, I, I must have a problem with... Uh, uh, Video driver here. So what I'm going to do instead is that I'm going to go to uh, okay. I'm just going to uh, copy the finished model for the way. I'm missing some time here. But I did it yesterday. So I'm just I'm just going to show you around. Um. The castle is back. It's turning like crazy. So if my computer crashes, uh, I wouldn't be very surprised. Okay, so save everything. I should have a new module. Well, okay. So here we start the server here. Oh, my video driver is just going nuts here. Okay. My new module is here. I can enable it. And now I should have some new settings. There they are. Right from Amazon settings. So this is what I just created, what you saw me create. Okay. And I'm going to set that up real fast and show you the results. Uh, so Okay, good. So my associated account is this. Uh, let me do. And I want to put it in um, content side position. Yeah, let's say one point five. 
Well, this is happening in the background. I, I showed you what I copied over. Uh, so what I copied over was the uh, the actual part that I that I need to add to my content type, which has a product SKU, which is the reference of the product on Amazon. Um, and then I it has its own driver. And its own driver is doing an additional thing, display, which is displaying on the front end. And what, what this is doing is that it's getting the settings that I built earlier and building a shape that has all those settings uh, set accordingly, plus the product queue which comes from the part. And yeah, I don't know what happened here. Uh, so my module is created. I can go to content types, go to my review type, edit it, and add a new part. Amazon. And now, when I go to my content types, I can look at my existing review, edit it, and now I have a product queue. Field, so I can take the product stream from the Amazon URL and I can paste it here, publish, and now I can go back, hopefully, except that I don't want to set my settings, I saved my settings, but yeah, I didn't save my settings. Uh, mm -hmm. uh. Oh, yes, that's oh, yes, that's a bug. That is known and that has been fixed in change set 4585. Uh, and that will be the last thing that I will do. I promise I am, I am done after that. Um, I will just fix that problem just so that I can show you the real of all I've done before. And I need to go to da, 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 core settings. And Uh, I do it for a here. I need to copy. That one. And this way, I'm going to be able to save my settings. That's uh, that's an option that it's been fixed. Uh, 
And uh, so this file from Amazon badge module is something that oh, I just leave in the middle of, uh, of the compiling here. Um, yeah, so that module is something that I intended to actually publish to the galleries uh, during the demo, but at mm -hmm. I'm really short on time here. I apologize for that. Uh, I will do it right after the demo so that you can download it and play with it. And I will also make all the code available um, as well of the finished uh, project. And I will probably also make a series of blog posts going into details uh, on each of the of the different parts of the demo. Okay, so hopefully now I should be able to save my settings. Uh, Save. Yeah, this, this time it worked. Um, right. Quantum five times. Here has the first two. I need to save that apparently. Okay. Oh, oh. Huh. It didn't save. Mm -hmm. Again, to say, I think I heard Okay, so it's not persisting for some of them. Um, and I copied all the code from that. Oh, no. here's what I didn't uh, include in the project. Okay. So, let me try again. So now it's recompiling uh, dynamically my work which explains a little bit there. And I just saw it's gone again. There you go. This time it's safe. And there it is. And here there is a little thing that's interesting, which is that this shape here is rendering outside of the content, of the usual content rendering zone. And this is something that uh, people who know, who already know of Shard in uh, will be interested to, uh, to find out about. Uh, uh, what, what I'm really doing here is that I'm adding the shape to the zone that I specified in settings. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting the context, I'm getting to the layout, I'm getting to the zone, and then I'm adding that shape to the zone. And this is an interesting technique that you might find some use for. Um, and after that, what I wanted to do was publish the module, which I will do uh, uh, in, a, in less than an hour. So you will be able to download that module. And I also wanted to build a list of reviews to include that, so that I'm able to navigate directly uh, to my reviews. But, uh, well, let's leave that to, as an exercise to the reader. You will get the full source code of that whole thing, of that whole demo, plus the, the database in place where you have the list of reviews and all that stuff. So I published the, the finished uh, thing, but we are pretty close to it here. So this is, this is not bad. We've actually managed to create in the, an hour and a half a new module, a new theme, uh, and a reasonable website that looks kind of okay. I mean, that's pretty nice. So with this, I, I'm just going to give back the controls to Brian. Uh, and, uh, um, and this is it. This was my, uh, 
you know, our chat demo, I hope you enjoyed it. And I think we might have some time for questions. I don't know, Brian. Hey, thanks everybody. Uh, yes, if, if, if you don't mind staying around and do a bit of Q&A, then uh, I certainly don't have a problem with it. Um, thank you very, very much, uh, Bertrand. That was um, a very interesting uh, demonstration. It was nice to see some, some hands-on demonstration here uh, of Orchard uh, CMS. Um, if you have time for some Q&A, I, I would like to ask one thing first here, uh, and that is, um, what initiated uh, Orchard uh, CMS? Um, so I can I can speak for myself. I, I can't really uh, I, I don't really know what uh, what happened in the in the heads of the powers that be, you know. But uh, so when I joined Microsoft, uh, uh, before that I was working in a small uh, web company that was uh, doing CMS. And uh, I built a, a very early uh, web CMS based on .NET 4.0. So I had lots of ideas about how to build a CMS and, uh, and why it was interesting to build one. Uh, it was already visible at that time, and that was about 10 years ago, uh, that uh, the direction the web was going was that people would build more and more sites based on uh, applications, CMS, instead of starting from scratch. And I was absolutely convinced of that. And uh, I tried to sell the idea, and it took a lot of time. And uh, I think what happened in the end was not that I, I was successful at selling the idea, it's that other people who had the power to make it happen had the same idea. Uh, and I was lucky enough to, uh, uh, to get an opportunity to be on that team, which I jumped on uh, eagerly. Um, and yeah, that, that's why it happened. It's just the way the market, especially of uh, what we call web apps, which are value-added providers, people who actually build websites very, very fast, and, uh, you know, uh, they build your website in, in a week and charge you a few thousand dollars for it, you know. That's a lot of people doing that kind of work, and uh, then it, there is a whole continuum that scales up to, uh, to uh, big companies building big websites. Um, there is a whole spectrum there, but... Uh, CMS are more and more important to build websites, and uh, uh, we felt that uh, there was a need for uh, a different approach of CMS, and one that was built on .NET, because the really extremely successful ones are, are all on PHP. Uh, we do have .NET Nuke that, that has been very successful, uh, but we wanted something that was, you know, based on, on what we were for, for PHP. Yeah. And then Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, let's quickly answer some questions here. Um, yes, John Tabox, yes, the present is being recorded and it will be uh, uploaded. You can find the presentations on the www.linux.org site. Um, there's our archives up there. Uh, Sean said. Um, so, do you want me to take some of the questions here? Or do you want to read them? And, uh... Yes, feel free to do that. Okay, you so. Can just uh, take them away. One question is, uh, what would you consider to be the strong points of Orchard as compared to Drupal, the Facebook, and Braco? Um, so first, the Facebook and Braco, I think we're, we're taking a different, a different approach. I wouldn't say that necessarily one is better than the other. And, uh, I'm not just trying to manage the safety issue. Uh, it, it's also that, yeah, for, for example, Umbraco has, uh, it is, I, I don't know very, very deeply those, uh, those offers, but Umbraco is, has uh, a notion of uh, content hierarchy. Um, 
that seems to be very strong in what they are doing. Uh, we have more of a notion of a flat uh, content hierarchy, and then you impose structure on top of that instead of uh, putting the structure at the at the level of the of the definition of the content itself. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what I'm being very clear here, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are different approaches to uh, CMS, and there is room for more than one approach, and actually you can see that in uh, the PHP CMS, where you have uh, Drupal, Joomla, and WordPress, which are taking very, very different approaches. WordPress started being just a, a blog. Now it's including more custom um, content types, but uh, at the root of it, it, it still is very much a plug engine. Um, Joomla has a different approach to the admin UI. It has its, its own, you know, uh, concepts and, uh, and its own way of presenting things that work with some people, that's so well with others, and actually that reflects in the, the modules that are available for it. Joomla has been very, very, very successful, uh, but it, I mean, yeah. You can notice the differences when you go to the list of modules and, uh, and you, you look at which ones are the most successful. You can see that they are addressing slightly different audiences. Um, the one that Orchard maybe looks the most like uh, internally is Drupal. Um, some of some of us on the team are kind of in love with Drupal actually, <laughs> and uh, you, you, you can if you know Drupal you you recognize a few things uh, in Orchard that uh, that are structured in a similar way. Um, the idea of content types being composed from uh, different parts that has that has it, its equivalent in something like Drupal, and uh, there, there are some uh, some interesting ideas that that we really liked. Um, so yeah, different approaches, and uh, really, I, I would encourage anyone to actually check out all the existing offers on the net, of course, but all the existing offers, and, and actually determine the one that they like the best, that corresponds the most to how they like to do things. Uh, I think Orchard being the latest one uh, in, in the that list of Orchard TMS um, has the advantage that it can take. Can, you can use all the latest uh, shiny stuff, such as dynamic from uh, .NET. You've seen some uh, some usage of that in shapes. Uh, and actually, we started developing Orchard before uh, dynamic was widely available in the stable uh, version. And you can actually see if you if you if you did some archaeological work in Orchard, you could see when exactly we adopted dynamic and when when we started to use it. And uh, there are actually places where we would like. More, but, uh, I think I'm going at a tangent here. Um, yeah, so yeah, different approaches. Pick the one that you like the best. Uh, okay, so that's a question from uh, Brian. Then, uh, hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, when you add parts to a content type, like you did with stars, stars. Would the rating get stored with the blog post or where? Okay, so I, uh, well, I could take take over the screen and, and show you in the database, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, you have a table per uh, path type. So you have a table for all the star ratings. In this case, you have a table for the routable path where you have the URL and the, the title. You have a table for the body and so on, and we just join on the on the table, and that's what constitutes your uh, your your content item. Uh, so your content item is composed. It's composed uh, logically in the application as a, a composition of parts, but in the database, it's also composed as a composition of reports in different tables. Um, so Tom Ellis is asking: Is there standard functionality? To be able to have a staging environment for content and be able to promote it to production. So that is, that is a very, very important feature that we, we don't have today. Uh, and, uh, but we do realize that it's a very, very important feature to have for CMS. Uh, this is just the beginning. So yeah, it, it will come. Um, how fast or scalable is the content manager in Orchard? I'm building a, a question from Michael Kramer. 
Um, I'm building a forum using custom content types, and the only thing I have is a worry about is what the performance will be with thousands of content items in the system. Okay, and I have some pages that are for specific posts, but I find them changing to the <laughs> This is a very, very long question, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, okay, well, <clears throat> We've done some tests with lots of contents, and uh, uh, it, it's scaling uh, reasonably linearly uh, in terms of number, number of content items. Uh, as with any uh, performance question, I would answer by telling you that you should do your own testing with the specific constraints that you have uh, on the specific uh, problem that you're trying to solve. Um, which is a way of saying we know how it scales for the cases that we tested, but we don't know how it will scale for your particular use case. Um, we have a few uh, features that are aimed at uh, scalability, such as multi identity and stuff like that. Um, if, if you do some performance testing and determine that uh, something uh, could work better, um, uh, performance bugs are Real bugs, so you can uh, uh, you can give us that feedback and uh, tell us how to reproduce your specific case, and uh, we find the uh, we either find a way to uh, well we can find a way to refactor your code so that it so like, works better, or if there are some adjustments to, do to the framework, you'd be uh, we'd be happy to investigate and, uh, and make corrections. Um, <clears throat> so Tony. He's asking, can we please have any more in-depth technical webcasts? Uh, yes, uh, we don't have many webcasts, uh, so this is, this is one, but uh, we need to do some more webcasts that are uh, focused on one specific problem. Uh, that is something that was scheduled for our chart one. Uh, it will happen, uh, but we've been, I mean, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have as much time as we needed to do that, but yeah, we, we absolutely agree that we need more in-depth webcasts uh, and also introductory webcasts. Um, Eric or Eric, I don't know, uh, is asking, I apologize about the name, uh, is asking if there are any books coming out for our chart. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting question that you could ask on the, the mailing list. Uh, Jakub, uh, again, uh, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this. Um, as a ASP.NET MVC3 developer, do I have good reasons to build my web application over our chart? Uh, it depends on the type of application. If it's a very content oriented application where your, the main resource that you manipulate uh, is content, and I will tell you what I mean by content. Uh, yes, you will, you will uh, get a lot of advantages, uh, such as uh, the theming engine, uh, such as the ability to compose your contents with existing modules. So you've seen uh, how I've added stars, star ratings to existing content types. But uh, if you create your own content types, uh, you can add comments, you can add tags, all of that almost for free. And that is a big advantage. Now, if your, if your uh, site is more like an application that has a complex, uh, a complex model that doesn't correspond to a content-based model, such as blogs, uh, knowledge management, uh, e-commerce catalogs, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing that you, you can put the content label on. If, if your application is, is Something that is that has different kinds of rules, then actually our chart might be might uh, impair uh, your your progress by imposing a model that's not adapted to what you're trying to do. So as always, determine what your um, what your business model is, uh, what what you need to implement, and if there is a fit, there is a fit. If there is not a fit, no big deal. Just use MVC and uh, that's it. Uh, this being said, um, a module in our chart is just an area, an MVC area. 
Um, so you can actually integrate existing classical MVC applications into a, an Orchard application as a module and two things uh, separate. So there is an option if you want something that, that has both models. Uh, William is asking, how would we develop modules and test them on live sites running on Azure? Um, yes, that, that's a good question. The problem with Azure is that um, the file system is not uh, reliable in the sense that if you create a file on, on, on one instance, uh, uh, it doesn't exist on the other one. Um, so you, this is why you need to use blob storage for media, for example. And uh, we could have um, a mechanism where we get some modules from blob storage, for example, instead of getting them from the car system. Um, but until we have something like that, uh, you need to, to prepare your, your the image of your website uh, locally and, and that. So I understand that it's inconvenient, especially if you are trying to implement a module that has some specific Azure functionality. But unfortunately, that's uh, that's what we have today. Um, so Sasha is asking if we have more live meetings on our chart CMS. And actually, we used to have those after each after each coding iteration. And uh, this is my fault. I kind of uh, I, I was kind of sloppy on that, and I, I, I let it slide, and uh, we are not having them. Uh, I will try to bring them back. Uh, so if you subscribe to the mailing list, uh, you can find uh, how to do that from the Orchard Project.net website. Uh, I will send uh, notices the next time we have a, a live meeting, and I will also post on the discussions forum of the place. And with this, I think I answered all the questions that we have uh, on the Q&A tab. So if you want to ask uh, something else, you have a few seconds. Otherwise, um, feel free to contact me uh, on email. I gave you my, my email, D-L-E-R-O-Y, at Microsoft. Uh, you can also ask questions on the discussions on the complex. Uh, thank you very much for attending, and uh, I hope to see you soon on the forums and uh, to see all the wonderful things that you will create on the module gallery on our chart project.net. Oh, we have one last minute question uh, from William. How about implementing a module that accesses file storage, like for getting user up upload videos or images? Uh, so there is actually a, a media module that already exists. Uh, out of the box. So I, I would be able to read the rest of your question if my uh, uh, driver wasn't behaving so badly. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, I can't read the end of the question. My, my driver is just going nuts right now. Uh, but he's, he's asking that. What? He, he, the question, you want me to read up the question for you, Burton? Yes, please. The question is, how about implementing a module that accesses file storage? Like for letting users upload videos or images, how would you start that? Okay. Uh, so, two things. We have a media module that is already there, and uh, it knows how to use uh, blob storage on Azure. Uh, and it relies on uh, an abstraction of the file system that also knows how to work on Azure and you could actually implement your own version of that if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, the, the media module is definitely the place to start for that. So look into that. Uh, there are also a few modules on the gallery that are doing image gallery. Um, there are actually three or four already. Um, and there is a couple of modules that are doing video. Uh, there is even one that is doing smooth streaming uh, from, uh, from uh, Orchard using IIS uh, smooth streaming. So I invite you to, that, that is actually a, a piece of advice that, that I'd like to give to everyone. When you want to do something on Orchard, uh, look at what exists already. Look at how other people are doing things. 
for the moment, all the modules are uh, uh, open and free. So you can you can crack them open, look at the source code, and uh, and get the ideas from that. Uh, see how things are done. Uh, look into our code and, and look how it's done. Uh, and so on this particular question, the, the media module is where you should start. Okay, well, as I was saying, thank you very much for attending. Um, I will post all the all the contents uh, for this talk uh, shortly. And uh, well, again, I'm uh, I'm hoping to see you uh, on the forums, and, uh, and I hope to see your creations on the gallery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bertrand. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I just want to remind people that for those that registered, uh, we'll be drawing out some lucky winners of the Diskeeper 2010 Pro license, and we'll be sending it um, on to you. And just to reiterate as well, yeah, Jakub, um, yes, the video and the event is recorded and will be uploaded to the lidnook.org website. So that's www.lidnook.org slash archives.aspx. That's where our archives of all 